President Bush, September 11th, September 10th, 2001. We did an educational tour in Florida. This is him coming off the stairs in Jacksonville, Florida. After September 10th, we then moved over to Sarasota, Florida. Sarasota, Florida, the plane was put on a ramp at the Sarasota airport. Plane is always protected. You're gonna laugh, but the protection we use is the cones you see in the picture here, that is our protection. 60 feet off the plane, we put these little cones. Outside the cones, United States of America. Inside the cones, Air Force One's property. And then what you do inside there, if you can see in the picture, there's a big African-American who is my top cop, a guy named Will Chandler. Six foot four, about 240, just an enormous man. We give him everything that he needs to go ahead and protect that aircraft. If you come through those cones, he's yours. I mean, he is gonna take you down. So what he has to do is he's got four lines of defense. He's gotta come up to those cones and he's gotta figure out whether you mean harm or not. He walks up to the cones. The first line of defense is he's gonna talk you out of it. Big man, figure out what you're gonna do. You may be just taking pictures or you may need harm. He'll talk you out of it. Second line of defense, he's gonna knock you down. He's gonna basically arm to arm, com hand to hand combat. He's got a clip on tie. He doesn't want you choking him, so he takes the clip on tie out, which then exposes the scar from his ear all the way across his neck where he got in a knife fight as a kid, which he obviously won. He's just letting people know that. If that doesn't work, he shows you the nine millimeter. If that doesn't work, he talks into his lapel. A guy comes out of the stairs of that plane with an M4, poof, and that's the end of your visit to Air Force One. This is how we secured the plane that day. The plane was ready to go the afternoon of September 10th. September 11th, all of us got ready to go out to the plane. Three hours prior, we all show up at the plane. The plane was ready to go. While we were moving, terrorists were moving up and down the East Coast, hijacking airliners. We had no knowledge of this. I know the media took a hit at President Bush saying that he had to have known about it. I guarantee you he didn't. None of us knew what was going on. They caught us with our pants down. As I show up that day, I did what every Air Force officer did early in the morning. I did my PT. I had to run a mile and a half in 13 and a half minutes. All right, Marines and Army guys, laugh your head off. Hey, I had to do 40 push-ups, 40 sit-ups in two minutes. You can laugh again, but that's the reason I came to the Air Force, so. <laughs> Did my part, I showed up to the plane, waited for the big cop to give me the signal to come across. He gave me the signal to come across. As I came across, he went ahead and saluted. Sir, no one was killed or injured last night. That's all I want to hear from him. If you're going to take away from the President's message of the day, you kill or injure somebody at Air Force One, you will take away from that message for many a day. I go up those stairs. Crew chief comes up. Hey, I'm a pilot. I don't do any of the dirty work. So I got a guy. Guy comes up, tells me he's done everything. Got the oil, got everything all checked, gives me the status of the jet. Then we got a secondary guy, a flight engineer, a chief mass sergeant in the Air Force. Same thing, comes up and lets me know the status of the jet. President Bush was famous for trying to find something wrong with, just joke around with you, sarcasm. So I would make sure that nothing was wrong with that jet. I would go through every room in case he walks by, because I don't want him to give me the attention getting step he was famous for. Just kind of hit you in the chest and go, Tillman, I don't want that. So I went through each room was inspecting each room, the flight attendants, 10 of them on board, they would proudly show me each room. Abadine is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidine. As I got to the first room, the president's bedroom, everything perfect as always. His flight attendant was taking care of business. All of a sudden, I get a phone call. Over the uh, plane's PA system, the radio operator, Colonel Tillman, pick up a white phone. We had white phones and beige phones, about 87 phones on board. White phones, normal communication, beige phones, classified communication. I pick up the white phone, radio operator says, sir, come on upstairs immediately. As I come upstairs, this is what the radio operator shows me. The first tower has been hit by an unidentified aircraft. At this time, there were no words coming to us from any of the agencies. I call them the voweled agencies, NSA, OSI, FBI, you name it. There was no communication with these folks. The plane has over 40 phone lines, 40 capabilities available to it to get communication. None of those lines were going off at this time. 
It was an aircraft accident that hit the tower. I told the radio operator to go ahead and take a look at it because we knew we'd be going to New York because there's going to be obviously lives lost and damage. We assumed we'd be leaving to New York shortly. I go back downstairs, start working through the uh, rest of the jet. Radio operator, Colonel Tellman, pick up a beige phone. That's kind of my signal that something's gone wrong. I pick up the beige phone. He says, get up here immediately. We're executing plans such and such. I go running upstairs. This is what the radio operator shows me. They now have footage of the second airplane hitting the towers. At this point, all the phone lines are coming alive. Every agency on the earth wants to know what our status is and how we're going to be able to move the president immediately. That was our plan of attack. The other part of it was we were told at that time that there were a group of about nine aircraft hijacked, one over Florida, and we were a target. We were a sitting duck. My plan was to move the jet at that point, to get it out of the way, let the president come to another location, and we'd move him that way. Talking with the Secret Service, stand by. We're about to make the decision. Second picture of the second tower getting hit. All of, these footage, all of this footage was from normal television. So all the plane had at that time was an antenna to hit ground-based television. It wasn't what it is today, where it has the ability to get satellite. So we had basically a tuner, the radio operator, tuning it to get all the, all the stations that he could get to go ahead and get footage on this. Luckily, all the local stations had gone national. So all the footage was off the Today Show, Good Morning America, et cetera. As we're sitting there waiting to get orders as to what to do, we're executing a plan to move the president. You all remember Andy Carr leaning over the president, letting him know the country's under attack. President addresses the children in the elementary school, then moves to the room behind him. He's now sitting there talking on a classified phone with his advisors around him. You can see Carl Rove. You can see all his top-level advisors giving him information. So he was advised at that point of what's going on. My boss then explains to me that the president wants to move immediately and head back to Washington, D.C. I'll let you know, none of the plans we were about to run had taken the president back to Washington, D.C. When they wrote these plans, there was no idea that a Texan was going to be in office and all he wanted to do was go kick ass immediately. The plans were not designed for that. The President of the United States came running to us as fast as possible in the motorcade. At the same time, we got word that the Pentagon had been bombed, okay? not had been attacked by an aircraft, but had been bombed. This was kind of the fog of war. If the Pentagon's been bombed versus an aircraft flowing into it, what does it mean to anybody? Anything different? Yeah, there's a ground-based attack now as opposed to airliners being hijacked. So it's more significant. Taking them back to Washington wasn't going to be the right answer. Pentagon bomb, bombs going off around the mall area. That's what we were past at the time. The president comes running to us in the motorcade. 747, capability to start all four engines at the same time. Two APUs, everything's up and running. President starts and hits the tarmac, the right side of the plane's running. We bomb sweep everybody coming in the left side. Plane's ready to go. We've got everybody on board that we need. We start taxiing out. Secret Service comes to the cockpit, lets me know that the shooters have seen somebody at the end of the runway. They need me to take off opposite direction. Take off with a tailwind, not a big deal for the 747. Tremendous capability. We're extremely light. But the guy at the end of the runway, the concern was they said he had a long gun. He'd come up to the side of the fences, and they had him in his sights, and the service was running to him immediately. I took off opposite direction. Okay, Mr. Ryan, you've got, you had all the formulas, how to move and all that stuff. I'm a simple pilot. For me, all it was is you pull back, the houses get smaller. You push down, the houses get bigger. <laughs> now in the civilian community, they pay me a hell of a lot of money to make that median perfect every time, and I'm very thankful to it. But that's what we did. We took off, rotated out, climbed out roughly about 9,000 feet per minute. The goal was to get away from the shooter. Now, a lot of good old boys in here and good old ladies, I know you've been in fields before and you've seen planes fly overhead and you've had your guns and you've tried to shoot them. Now, you've probably been like, damn, I missed them again. Well, the chances of you hit them, hitting them is extremely low. So that's the theory I was using. The faster you go, the quicker you climb, the quicker you turn, chance of the guy not hitting you. The guy at the end of the runway was the same thing that we countered the whole day. He was not a threat. It was a man that came with his kids to the end of the runway to go ahead and see Air Force One. He had an old VCR camera, the old ones you put on your shoulder. Not a good day for him. But <laughs> one, one would only guess that his kids were introduced to the Secret Service and they're probably servicemen, you know, they're Secret Service guys today because they love it. 
Welcome to Airborne, the latest programming initiative from the Aero News Network. Hosted by Ashley Hale, Airborne is a visually stunning weekly high-def newscast featuring guest appearances and commentary from some of aviation's leading dignitaries, as well as ANN's own familiar faces. With aggressive reporting, extensive video, and a number of special aero features, Airborne offers truly engaging, fast-paced aero news content and analysis of lasting value to all of aviation. We climbed out of Sarasota as we're climbing out. Jacksonville Center advises us that we have traffic overhead descending into us. They've shut their transponder off and they're not talking to anybody. At this time, I wasn't sure what the status of the hijackers were. It's possible they could have been overhead us and they could have followed us out and now they were going to descend, crash into us over Florida. Pretty far-fetched, but I wasn't going to take any chances. So at that point, we started moving out towards northern Florida. The controllers then advised that as we moved, the airliner held its pass. Turned out later it was an airliner that had lost its transponder, switched to the other transponder, but had not made the subsequent call to Jacksonville Center. We turn out to the north. At the same time, the president's downstairs with his top level. He's got Andy Carr down there, the military aide to the president with the football and the Secret Service. On the time, he is on the phone with the vice president who's in a secure location. The vice president passes to the president that Air Force One is next. Doesn't know how it's going to happen, but we are the next target. What he said was, Angel is next. Angel is the classified call sign of Air Force One. Very few people knew the call sign. So for somebody to call in and say, Angel is next, pretty credible threat. At that point, I asked the mill aide for military jets to cover me, have any kind of fighter support, as well as an AWACS, some kind of radar plane overhead. We start working our way up the northern panhandle. As we're starting to move along, the radio operators passed me that the president has just given the authority to the fighter pilots to shoot down the final airliner that has been hijacked. We had planned to take the president into Washington, D.C. still. We were working our way, maybe taking him towards Camp David. At that point, the FAA advises the final airliner has now made its turn over the Ohio Valley and is starting to work its way into Washington. It is on a direct line heading into either Camp David or Washington, D.C. We abort the plan to take them back into Washington at that point. We start moving out into the Gulf of Mexico. As we start heading into the Gulf of Mexico, it's pretty much a time compression. Within the first hour, everything had occurred, but it seemed like it took hours to make things happen. We then get word the flight heading to Washington, D.C. had crashed. It's off the radar. All of us, to include the president, thought our own fighters had killed Americans. It was the sickest feeling I've ever had in my life. This is all that's result, this is all that's left of that airliner. The true heroes in my mind of September 11th were the people that took control of this aircraft again. And unfortunately they crashed it, but they didn't bring it into Washington, D.C. If that plane had hit Washington, D.C., it would have made, it, thousands would have been killed. So in my mind, they're the true heroes and a true memorial to them at that point. But at that point, we really thought the fighters had taken that plane down. We subsequently learned 20 minutes later after accountability of the fighters that no, they had not attacked the aircraft. The aircraft for some reason had gone down and now we know how. Aero TV's live coverage of the 55th annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show is brought to you in part by the following sponsors.